August 17, 1943, England. On the first anniversary of their operations against Fortress Europe, the 8th Bomber Command prepared 376 B-17s for the two most critical targets on their list, the ball bearing plants at Schweinfurt and the Messerschmitt Aircraft Factory at Regensburg, both deep in Germany. What an anniversary. Just a year ago, we flew that first mission to Rouen. 12 B-17s flying 56 miles to Tarkov. Now we were taking 376 fortresses 500 miles into Germany. Never had we prepared for so rough a mission. In 1943, the AAF was still growing up. The Luftwaffe had already reached its peak. But our boys taking their battle folders knew it. By the time we turned in our personal stuff, it was well understood that the projected doubleheader would bring on a large scale and costly air battle. In chapels all over England, most of the men turned to their ministers, rabbis, or priests. Getting into the trucks, we didn't dream that August 17th was being written into air history. Not only because of us, there were other soldiers in the skies. This was the same day that Sicily fell to the Allies. The same day that the RAF bombed Pinamunda, the V-2 rocket plant. The same day that General Kenny's B-25s destroyed 200 Jap planes at Wewak in eight minutes. And this day, our double mission involved the deepest penetration ever attempted into Germany and the largest bomber force to be dispatched to date. We knew that as we went further into Germany, we'd hurt her more. But we also knew we'd have to pay a higher price for admission. And now the last briefing as the pilots recheck the details of the mission with their crews. Individuals no longer existed. We were now 10-man teams, and on our teamwork would depend our success and perhaps our lives. Action against Schweinfurt got underway. The Regensburg task forces had just hit their target. A vast and intricate machine of destruction had been set in motion. Behind these modern warriors were weeks of high command planning. Now crewmen took care of routine duties. Ahead of us were four hours of rugged action. Our guns were going to be especially important today. At the briefing, they told us we'd have help from short-range fighters and eight their support mediums. The fighters were supposed to take us about halfway. The mediums were to bomb diversionary targets. But for the worst part of the trip, we'd be on our own. Finally, after a few hours delay due to bad weather, 2,300 men counted the seconds. American bombers had never been stopped. Although German defenses had stiffened, American formations had not been prevented from reaching their objectives once they responded to the green takeoff signal. As always, each thundering run was an epic of suspense until 30 tons of bombs, plane, and men were lifted from the earth.
The leader of the first wing, Colonel William Gross, swept in a huge circle around the field. Gradually, the second and third bombers edged into position. The sky quickly filled with stately fortresses sliding through space. But as soon as they got into formation over the British fields, they were picked up by German radar. Across the channel, the tentacles of the enemy's locator system, having touched the flying fortresses, now pinpointed them in space. Luftwaffe experts accurately plotted the American course, altitude and speed, and promptly informed their fighter control. Immediately, at dozens of Nazi airdromes from as far north as Denmark to down around Paris, German fighter units began to send up everything they had. Their order was, intercept and destroy the oncoming fortresses. The answer to the increasing Allied bomber offensive was this stepped up German fighter strength. Waves of opposition screamed off the map of Europe. In spite of the Luftwaffe, Allied planners selected our targets according to Allied Air Force priorities. That's why, merely three hours after the fourth bomb wing had paralyzed the Nazis' Messerschmitt factory at Regensburg, we in the first bomb wing were on our way to strike Schweinfurt in the face of an aroused enemy. As we began to run into flak, our gunners could feel the entire German Air Force warming up. Flying in enemy territory, we felt like goldfish in a bowl, waiting for the attack. Strict radio silence was maintained, while trained eyes searched the sky. savage blows since the war began. Although Jerry knocked 20 bombers out of the sky on the road to Schweinfurt, we never broke formation. Despite the ferocity of the attack, which extended all the way to and from the target, we pressed forward. Our guns kept burning the enemy out of the sky. Approaching the bomb run began the most critical defensive period. Now we divided into smaller groups, sacrificing our mutual defensive firepower to bomb the target most efficiently. The crucial moment. The moment around which the entire mission revolved was now in the steady hands of our bombardiers. Each bomber was now committed. No more evasive action until bombs away. At this time, the formations were most vulnerable to attack. It didn't matter. We had a job to do on Schweinfurt. We had 400 tons of high explosives to deliver.
After getting 80 hits on the two main ball bearing plants, we could defend ourselves again, at least to the extent of evasive action against flak and fighter attack. But the main idea now is to get home fast. At the British landing fields, word on the sky battle was out. Red flares were expected. That meant wounded aboard. These planes had priority at landing. Many of the fortresses themselves were crippled. A few came in with feathered props or with knocked out landing gear. After struggling home at housetop altitude, one B-17 with wounded aboard was committed to a crash landing. the ship was my prayer. The anniversary battles lost us more men and aircraft in a single day than the 8th Bomber Command had lost in our first six months of operations over Europe. We who carried the war 500 miles to the enemy's industrial heart knew better than anyone how expensive it was. We had lost 60 bombers and their crews. What happened this 17th day of August, year 1943, was a testament to American men with modern weapons and a very old idea, fighting for freedom. On this day, high altitude bombers engaged in their greatest and, from the point of view of loss, their most disastrous air battle to date. Nonetheless, the results justified the price we paid. Out of these trials by fire, there did emerge from the struggle one of the most polished and powerful instruments of warfare ever assembled. This force of men and planes, this accumulation of skill and experience, became the power and might of the United States Air Force. Oh. 